for uh, joining us. I'm Matt Grossman. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research, uh, and we appreciate you accommodating the room change and the house for still uh, getting us uh, in today. Uh, hopefully everybody's in the right room to talk about uh, mental health uh, in Michigan. Uh, we have our next forum on June 14th. We're going to be talking about the federal ARPA dollars uh, in localities and how uh, they are being uh, allocated. Uh, and then we'll take a little uh, break and have our next forum uh, in September. Uh, I also wanted everybody to uh, be reminded uh, that we do have a lot of materials on our website at ippsr.msu.edu. Uh, that will include all of the presentations uh, from today and some additional uh, links. And then we have that archive going back uh, for a decade of events. Uh, and so if you're wondering, why don't we have a forum on or have we had a forum on, chances are it's somewhere uh, in there and you can go back through all that uh, material, including uh, videos, and catch up. Uh, these uh, presentations also come out of a grant program that we run uh, at MSU uh, called the Michigan Applied Public Policy Research Program. Uh, and not all of those uh, reports, which are all designed to uh, influence policy to make uh, researchers communicate uh, their findings uh, to uh, things ongoing issues in Michigan. All of those reports are also available uh, on our website and that includes even more uh, coverage of issues uh, facing uh, the legislature uh, and uh, Michigan. We also have uh, an even broader uh, policy research database where we have students who are summarizing research from anywhere, MSU or anywhere else, that might be relevant to ongoing policy discussions and you can search that by uh, issue area as well. But if you don't find anything, just contact us and we're happy to put you in touch uh, with the people uh, who could be uh, most helpful to you at MSU. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Arnold Weinfeld uh, to introduce the panel. Thanks, Matt. And again, thanks everyone for being here. I'm Arnold Weinfeld, I'm Associate Director at the Institute and uh, appreciate everyone being here today. Uh, May actually is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. So uh, we're very pleased today to have uh, some presenters that are very involved in the field. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, two of them are recent doctoral graduates from Michigan State University. So uh, congratulations to those folks, uh, Katie and Hannah. Um, you know, I've been at MSU almost seven years now and I've learned one thing. Um, these are earned. Uh, these people work very, very hard uh, to get to this level and be experts in their field. So greatly appreciate the work that they do and the work that Marianne does uh, through her association. As Matt mentioned, uh, the work comes from our MAPPER grants, our Michigan Applied Public Policy Research Grants, which we make available to faculty uh, during the course of an academic year uh, to uh, help them with their research on uh, public policy issues of importance, so uh, certainly mental health is one of those. So I'm here to introduce the speakers and let them get going. Uh, I'll do this in alphabetical order. Katie Anderson uh, is a May 2023 psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner graduated who just obtained her doctorate in nursing practice from Michigan State University. She's been a nurse for over six years and has a multitude of clinical experiences. Uh, for the Doctor of Nursing project, Katie conducted a policy analysis on integrated behavioral health care in Michigan, and that's what you'll be hearing um, from today. Uh, Marianne Huff is a licensed master social worker and currently serves as president and CEO of the Mental Health Association of Michigan. Uh, Marianne has 14 years of executive field level staff leadership and advocacy within the behavioral health field. She served as the Executive Director of the Allegan County Community Mental Health Services and is Director of Advocacy for the Ability Center of Greater Toledo in Sylvania, Ohio. And as, as an advocate at the Michigan Protection and Advocacy Services, Marianne helped individuals and families access mental health services. Uh, and Hannah Shang. <coughs> Hannah is a recent graduate as well from the uh, Doctor of Nursing Practice Program of Michigan State University and a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner concentration. She is also a, a regional float uh, registered nurse for Henry Ford Health. And her project was on parity, mental health parity, is that right? Okay, great, so Marianne is up first. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, my name is, again, is Mary Ann Huff, and I'm with the Mental Health Association in Michigan. And before I talk about mental health public policy work, which is really a large part of what the Mental Health Association does, um, I have been the director for almost four years now, but we've been around since 1936. And um, Arnold was talking about Mental Health Awareness Month. Actually, we have Clifford Beers to thank for the fact that we have Mental Health Awareness Month in May. Clifford Beers wrote a book at the turn of the 20th century called A Mind That Found Itself, and he talked about his experiences in both public and private mental health or psychiatric hospitals. He was a stockbroker on Wall Street, and his book actually created the National Mental Health Association, which is now known as Mental Health America. And then a little bit later, um, I think 1949, they established uh, Mental Health Awareness Week, and then may become may became Mental Health Awareness Month. So we've been around for a long time and um, have a real rich history. And if you just Google Mental Health Association in Michigan, you'll find a lot of our story um, there. So um, again, a lot of my work is done at the state level. And so I'm going to provide an overview because I had the absolute pleasure of working with both Katie and Hannah over the last year on their projects, um, sort of just really being more of a mentor more than anything else. And so I want to pave the way for them because um, the bills, I'm going to kind of do a high level overview of the last legislative session, which was 2021 to 2022, because that's when they started their projects, and talk a little bit about 2023. So next. Thank you. So. Um, some of the things you know that we're going to talk about are indicated here. So 2021, basically the integrated care bills, uh, Senate's bills, 597 and 598, those were Senator Shirky's bills. Those were from the last legislative session. Um, mental health parity bills from 2021, 2022. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's pending currently, because these bills um, since we have a new legislative session, they have not been reintroduced, doesn't look like they will be. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about them because that actually dovetails into Katie and Hannah's projects. Um, I do want to talk about Senate Bill 83 that was actually waiting to be signed by the governor. There's a parity bill out there right now for this session, Senate Bill 27, and KB versus Lyon, the children's lawsuit. Next. Okay. So I'm going to start with historically kind of going chronological order. Um, some of you may recall the last legislative session, we had Senate Bills 597 and 598 that were introduced by previous Senator Mike Shirky. Um, these bills were defeated uh, late in, during Lane Duck in 2022. Um, this would, these bills would have included the integration of physical and beha behavioral health for people in the public mental health system. Um, and so what that would have meant is that currently our public mental health system is what's called the behavioral health carve out, which means that Medicaid dollars for people with the most significant mental health, mental illness, children with mental health conditions, people with substance use disorders, developmental intellectual disabilities, those dollars are literally set aside almost like in a sole source arrangement just for community mental health and the 10 managed care entities called PHPs or prepaid and patient health plans that manage those dollars. So those bills were defeated. Um, and then House Bills 49, 25 through 29, those was another attempt at system redesign by former state rep Mary Whiteford. Um, and that would have created one single prepaid and patient health plan across the entire state for community mental health. So it was a little different than the integration bills. It wasn't quite so much focused on behavioral, physical health integration, but that would have created a single prepaid and patient health plan instead of the 10 that we have. Those bills didn't go anywhere, so that is not going to happen. And then finally, we also had um, some par mental health parity bills, and I'm going to let um, Hannah talk to you. She'll talk in greater detail about what we mean by mental health parity. But basically, um, 
M. Ham and the Michigan Psychiatric Society with the American Psychiatric Association last year at this time worked on a set of bills that were introduced into the House Health Policy Committee, but they didn't go anywhere. So this kind of helps you make some sense of what Katie and Hannah are going to be talking about as part of their presentation. Next. Um, so here's our new legislative session. We've got, uh, for the first time, I think for pe most people know, for the first time in 40 years, we have both chambers in the executive branch controlled by the Democrats. Um, we have focus on gun control laws, and one that MHAM has really looked at is Senate Bill 83. Um, if you haven't followed that, Senate Bill 83 um, actually allows for what's called an extreme risk protection order. So that if somebody is deemed to be potentially a threat to themselves or somebody else, what that means is that the person who's worried about the person can go to court and get an extreme risk protection order, and thereby law enforcement can come and take away their guns from them so that they can't um, harm themselves or somebody else. Um, so in a way, we look at it from the Mental Health Association's perspective, we're looking forward to that in terms of maybe it will re it reduce the risk of, of suicide, self-inflicted harm. Um, so that's that's something to pay attention to. It's not necessarily a mental health bill, but given the fact that you know when you look at our mental health code and you see that there's certain criteria for person being identified as a person requiring treatment, meaning they need inpatient care, um, requires to some degree of concern that there may be a risk of harm to self or others. We see these, the mental health code part and Senate Bill 83 is kind of potentially working together, although they're not linked. Um, and then Senate, Senate Bill 27 is a mental health parity bill that was introduced uh, back in January by Senator Sarah Anthony. It's a reiteration of the federal law in some respects. Next. Um, KB versus Lyon, another huge case that um, it's a federal lawsuit that was filed against the state of Michigan in June of 2018 for failure to provide EPSDT services to kids under the age of 21. Um, basically what, what it says is that in order to keep children with serious emotional disturbance um, adolescents, you know, young people with mental health challenges that require community mental health services. And this includes also children and adolescents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There has to be a certain array of services, specialty supports provided by community mental health. What was happening was those services were not being provided across the board. The goal of those services is to keep children and adolescents out of a more what we call a more restrictive setting, which in our state right now, we only have one state psychiatric hospital for children. We used to have six years ago. Um, but to keep them out of a more uh, restrictive setting, out of an institution, since, this, since the CMH system was not doing that, Michigan Protection and Advocacy, which is now called Disability Rights Michigan, uh, the Honigman Law Firm, in the J.J. Conway law firm, they filed a suit against the state in federal court. It's my understanding that there may be, we may be hearing soon about a potential settlement of that case. So again, it's been going on for almost five years. Um, we know that that lawsuit caused, did sort of prompt a restructuring of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services within the behavioral health section. Now they have an Office of Children's Advocate, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem, there's an interim agreement. They are working on what's called the My Kids Now initiative. But I could tell you from the work I do, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one advocacy in addition to systems advocacy. I help a lot of families try to figure out how to access appropriate services for their kids in this state. Next. Where, question, where yes. is that one hospital for inpatient? Mental health for children. It's in Northville. <coughs> yeah, Hawthorne is in Northville. So I just spewed forth a whole lot of stuff. I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but here's my contact information. Um, here's my email, our website, and my phone number. If you would like any more information about anything regarding mental health public policy, please feel free to reach out to me. Visit our website 
And uh, we do have webinars, roundtable discussions about these issues too. So thank you very much. And I am now going to turn it over to Arno. Go ahead. Katie. My name is Katie Anderson. Um, I'm not as good as Marianne. I'm going to keep my notes up here with me. But I'm a recent graduate of Michigan State University. Um, I just graduated with my Doctor of Nursing Practice, as Arnold had mentioned. And I hope to be practicing as a psychiatric and mental health nurse practitioner after passing my boards this summer. So for my Doctor of Nursing project, I t chose to conduct a policy analysis on integrated care, inter integrated behavioral health care in Michigan, sorry. And then this is only a brief presentation of, um, with an introduction, significance, background, and a discussion of the policy analysis process. So the act of conducting a policy analysis helps to ensure that a systematic approach is being used when choosing specific policy options that fit a specific <coughs> population. For my project, the interest of community leaders and healthcare professionals were targeted to provide an analytical and strategic approach to identify and prioritize policy options which may in turn have an effect on population health outcomes. The integration of physical and behavioral health care services have been of interest of policymakers for many years. Yet changes to policies and laws regarding the integration of these services continue to meet resistance in the state of Michigan. Oh, could you go back one, sorry. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of my Doctor of Nursing project was to conduct a comprehensive policy analysis of current legislation related to integrated care in Michigan. When I began this project, there were two bills last session that I focused my initial analysis on, which were Senate Bills 597 and 598. The second purpose of this project was to develop recommendations for implementation of an integrated care delivery model in Michigan. In 2019, it was estimated that an upward of 14 million U.S. citizens were living with a behavioral health condition. In Michigan alone, 1.3 million people have a behavioral health diagnosis, and approximately 38% of those 1.3 million are not receiving care. Over the years, there has been increased attention related to the correlation between physical and behavioral health, and research shows that 68% of those living with a mental health condition suffer from one or more chronic conditions, meaning these persons are more likely to suffer from co-occurring chronic conditions. Populations suffering from co-occurring chronic conditions have also been found to have increased health care costs without seeing better health outcomes. And the spending for the Medicaid population with behavioral health diagnoses is approximately four times higher. It is also important to note that almost half of Medicaid enrollees have unmet needs for behavioral health conditions under the current system. Nationally, Medicaid covers about 14% of the population. It is interesting to see that Medicaid manages approximately 26% of all adults with serious mental illness and 21% of all adults with any mental illness in the United States. So this places Medicaid in a unique position when it comes to the integration of physical and behavioral health services. So throughout my project, it was apparent that the importance of defining integrated care to align with state or agency values and goals was extremely important. If you Google integrated care, you may stumble across a variety of definitions varying from person to person. At its core and throughout my policy analysis, integrated care was defined as an approach to reduce or overcome fragmentation of care and improve quality and safety of services. I also focused solely on the coordination and provision of behavioral health services with physical health services. An increasing attention has been given to the integration of physical and behavioral health services at the service delivery and financial level. It is important to ensure that a clear definition of what integrated care entails is provided to stakeholders. Although the integration of physical and behavioral health services has been found to improve health outcomes, many states, including Michigan, continue facing barriers to advance the integration of behavioral and physical health care, as the Medicaid services are often managed by multiple entities. When discussing Michigan's current public behavioral health system, there is a difference between the care provided to those with mild to moderate behavioral and health needs and those with significant behavioral health needs, i.e. those with significant mental health disorders, substance use disorders, and those with intellectual or developmental disabilities. The first population mentioned, individuals with mild to moderate behavioral health needs receive all of their physical health and non-specialty behavioral health benefits from a Medicaid health plan. The second specified population, or those with significant behavioral health needs, receives behavioral and physical health benefits from a bifurcated system. This system is separated by a Medicaid health plan 
which provides physical health and care management, and prepaid inpatient health plans, or PIHPs, responsible for behavioral health benefits and case management. Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services has noted that this specific bifurcated system has caused challenges for the specific population and the current system. Concerning Michigan's vision for integrated care among its Medicaid population, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has noted specific goals for improving its current system. These goals include broadening access to quality care, improving care coordination, and increasing behavioral health investment and financial stability. These goals are, accomplished by core, are accompanied by core values, including person-centeredness, family-driven, youth-guided, community-based, recovery-oriented, and culturally competent. In 2019, the Michigan <coughs> Department of Health and Human Services outlined the strengths and challenges of the state's current system and, integrated, and envisioned an integrated approach to managing care for this population's health. Senate Bills 597 and 598 were introduced to the Michigan Senate on July 15, 2021. These, bi these bills failed to pass and did not progress through the legislative process. Senate Bills 597 and 598, if passed, would have introduced specialty integrated plans defined as a separate entity that is either a managed care organization or a person operating a system of health care delivery and financing provided under section 3573 of the insurance code. This would combine traditional insurance companies management skills with behavioral health care organizations expertise and commitments. The actions and guidelines for a specialty integrated plan or a SIP, excuse me, operating as a community health, mental health services were to be set by um, June 1st of 2022. Senate Bill 598 was tie barred to Senate Bill 597, meaning they had to pass together. And although these bills underwent multiple revisions through 2022, these bills did not pass in the Senate. So for um, this final portion of the presentation, I'm just gonna go over how I conducted the policy analysis and what frameworks I've used um, for my project. So I will be touching on just the process at this time. Um, so, sorry, for my project, as I said earlier, the interest of community uh, leaders and healthcare professionals were identified to prioritize policy options and that can improve health outcomes. And um, as the changes to policies and laws regarding integrating care at the financial delivery level have met continued resistance in the Michigan legislature. I, I used a blended version of RDOC's A Practical Guide for Policy Analysis and the CDC's Analytical Framework to guide my project. So for domain one, this consists of problem identification, which was discussed previously in the introduction and background of this presentation. Michigan's current system remains bifurcated for Medicaid beneficiaries requiring behavioral health services as they continue to obtain services through separate entities. This, bi this bifurcation is difficult to navigate, results in fragmentation of care, lacks a single point of accountability, and can result in poor outcomes for these populations. Challenges noted from this bifurcated system include communication issues, cost shifting, data sharing, and finger pointing. Michigan currently has no common legislative strategy to support an integrated delivery system statewide. Domain two consists of identifying and describing policy options, a review of literature, surveying of best practices in other jurisdictions, and a conduction of an environmental scan were undertaken. After each policy option was identified, following the CDC's framing questions, three criteria were focused on, such as public health impact, feasibility, and economic and budgetary impact. This slide describes the literature review that was undertaken to identify other policy options. The list of databases and search terms were used to guide this literature review. 11 articles in total were synthesized for the purpose of this project. So from this literature review, only two sources focused on statewide integrated care strategies, exemplifying the need for further policy-based research regarding integrated care in different states. Barriers to the integration of physical and behavioral health care included funding, stakeholder perspectives, and only small populations being examined. A multitude of strategies were noted upon search of gray literature, but each state's approach appears to be unique depending on population needs, funding of, funding of initiatives, necessary changes to laws, and stakeholder perspective and agreeability. There was no, no one-size-fits-all approach throughout the United States noted. So step 2B of the policy analysis consists of describing policy options 
in the context of public health impact, which is a potential for policy to impact risk factors, quality of life, disparities, morbidity, and mortality. Feasibility, which is the likelihood that, that the policy can be successfully adopted and implemented. And then economic and budgetary impacts, which compares the cost to enact, implement, and enforce with the, the, value, with the value of the benefits. So this is a matrix that was adapted from the CDC's policy analytical framework, which uses the writer's perspective to weigh each policy option against each other. This step also includes maintaining the status quo or no change in policy. And then the other options that were considered were Senate Bills 597, 598, consolidation of separate agencies, and then also the piloting of a specialty integrated plan in a singular region of Michigan. Additionally, each policy option was prioritized. The piloting of a singular regional specialty integrated, implant, specialty integrated plan in Michigan appears to be a feasible option at this time if further integra integration efforts are to take place. As Senate Bills 597 and 598 had met res significant resistance, it does not appear that these are realis realistic options at this time. It is recommended that a more gradual and incremental approach, such as a pilot program, may be more feasible during this time. For domain three of this policy analysis, clarifying operational issues related to how the policy will operate and what is needed for implementation will be ensued. Current stakeholder involvement and agreeability will need to be taken into consideration. As there is no current plan to pilot a singular plan in Michigan, information will need to be provided to stakeholders on the significance of the problem and what is to be addressed. I would propo propose the initiation of a work group to align goals, priorities, and values of all stakeholders as one of the first steps needed. Further investigation needs to be undertaken to determine where funding or grant support will come from to support this pilot program. It would be recommended that the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services oversees this work group, approves of the plan, and sends requests for information to interested parties to gauge for interest and suitability for those who are interested in becoming a specialty integrated plan. Domain three of the policy analysis consists of making recommendations for or conducting additional back war, background work if the policy is not ready for prime time. At this time, it appears that low feasibility may be affected by insufficient stakeholder support. A more gradual, collaborative, and incremental policy development approach with recommendations should be undertaken in the future, as many financial integration efforts are in their infancy in many other states. Continued research should be pursued to obtain outcomes and benefit measures. As there is lacking quality and quantities of data regarding this topic, further research needs to be done and continued monitoring of state and federal policy changes and stakeholder perspectives should also continue to ensue. As mentioned previously, other states have successfully implemented a pilot program of specialty integrated plan prior to implementing statewide change. As past efforts have taken place in Michigan, it would be important to use these efforts to guide future work group efforts and address past barriers or issues that were faced. Again, all stakeholders, including PIHPs, health plans, and beneficiaries should be included. As this is a more incremental approach, it may not require statewide policy change, which was also recommended by the 298 initiative work group. A singular specialty integrated plan would not cause disruption to the entire system, which was also a previous concern of stakeholders, and metrics could be measured prior to further expansion if successful. So in conclusion, the integration of physical and behavioral health services has proven to be an effective way to reduce disparities through care coordination and reduction in fragmentation. Changes to Michigan's system to integrate these systems continues to meet resistance at the financial delivery system level. Progress is being made at the service delivery level through the expansion and implementation of pilot programs excuse me, of behavioral health homes in different counties of Michigan for Medicaid beneficiaries which shows forward movement towards integrating physical and behavioral health care. A more gradual and collaborative approach appears to be a promising option regarding the ways to address these health, how these health care services are provided. It is encouraging to see that a wide variety of innovative methods that other states are taking to integrate these services as more data will continue to arise as time goes on. I also think it's important to note that as nurses and nurse leaders, we have the ability to address policy issues and work towards policy change through the use of a systematic and analytical approach as noted by the conduction of this policy analysis. And then I just wanted to share this um, quote from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which states, the solution lies in integrated care, the coordination of mental health, substance abuse, and primary care services, 
Integrated care returns the best outcomes and is the most effective approach to caring for people with complex health care needs. And then just many thanks to my mentors, Dr. Don Goldstein, Dr. Ann Annis, um, Mary Ann, and um, Michigan State's Institute for Public Policy and Social, Social Research for allowing me to receive this grant and conduct my Doctor of Nursing project. So thank you everyone for being here and listening. Now we'll hear from Hannah regarding her work on mental health parity. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. Um, thank you to IPPSR for having me and thank you all for coming. Um, so this presentation is uh, reflects findings discussed extensively in a, a larger paper, and a briefing of that paper will be made available by the IPPSR as well. So, and happy Mental Health Month. Um, so, and then uh, just as a disclosure, um, I was funded by the Mapper Grant Program. Um, I don't have any other financial relationships or off-label uses either. So parity is the ability to access treatment for mental health and substance use disorders that's equivalent to treatment offered for medical conditions. And placing limitations on benefits is a common uh, insurance practice, but when um, health plans are more restrictive with uh, how they place limitations on mental health benefits than they are for physical health benefits, um, this is where we have a concern for lacking parity. And limitations can be um, categorized as financial limitations, quantitative limitations, or non-quantitative limitations. So financial limitations can include co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles, and out-of-pocket maximums. An example of possible lacking parity um, here is if a health insurance were to cover, uh, require a $20 co-pay for a psychiatric clinician but um, require a $10 copay for a general med medical clinician. Quantitative limitations are uh, numerical restrictions on the frequency, duration, or the quantity of treatment. And an example of possible lacking, uh, treat uh, lacking parity here is through day and visit limits. So if a um, insurance company were to cover 60 days for a medical hospitalization, but only 30 days for a psychiatric hospitalization, that would be a red flag for lacking parity. Finally, we have non-quantitative treatment limitations, and these are non-numerical restrictions, and, and they include any process, strategy, evidentiary standard, or other criteria that's used to limit the scope and the duration of benefits. NQTLs, you can go back, please. Thank you. Um, and an example of lack, possible lacking parity with NQTLs, or non-quantitative treatment limitations, um, they can often manifest in requiring more frequent uh, prior authorizations, medical necessity reviews, or step therapy uh, protocol for mental health uh, treatment. Overall, when parity is not present, these limitations restrict the coverage of mental health treatment more than what's restricted for physical treatment. This can lead to denials of coverage or delays in treatment, and they, it can be disproportionately placed on mental health care. Um, so the MHPAEA, the Men Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, was enacted in 2008 and it was created to prevent these inequitable restrictions on mental health care. It applies to self and fully insured individual and large group employment-based private commercialized um, health plans. And states were responsible, which by the way, that applies to 56% of Michigan's population. States were and still are responsible for ensuring the implementation of the MHPAEA through regulatory laws. Um, but Michigan has not been able to do this. All of the four uh, proposed bill packages have failed to advance past either the Health Policy Committee or the Senate, or the, uh, the Insurance Committee. So Michigan is not the only Mich um, state that's having difficulty enacting and implementing uh, the federal parity law. The federal government has observed this, which is why they enacted the Consolidated Appropriations Act um, in 2021. And with this uh, law, they require that um, the federal government do 
uh, 20 comparative analyses each year. They also require that health plans, every health plan, uh, makes these comparative analysis uh, reporting requirement um, reports available for auditing. So comparative analysis is a type of reporting requirement um, that requests information from health insurers that would determine their compliance, specifically with the non-quantitative treatment limitations because determining compliance with those is less transparent due to their non-numerical um, nature. So in the first round of comparative, anal comparative analysis evaluations, which was published in 2022, um, they had found, they were able to determine that zero of the 216 non-quantitative treatment limitations could prove compliance with the federal MHPAEA. So thinking back to those examples of uh, prior authorizations, medical necessity reviews, and the fail first or step therapy protocols, how many of those were inequitably placed on mental health benefits when they should not have been in blocked access to care? Since Michigan has not enacted a state law that would require compliance reporting, we have no clarity into whether mental health care is being restricted, but current evidence from the Consolidated Appropriations Act shows it's likely. As far as the significance, there's arguably never been a better time to protect mental health care. Drug overdose deaths increased 30% between 2020 and 2021. Mental illness is also highly prevalent right now. Half of all Americans will be diagnosed with a mental disorder in their lifetime. And the rest of the statistics here that 38 and a half of Michigan adults uh, reported not receiving needed care due to cost as well as 305,000 people, Michiganders, experienced a mental illness but did not receive treatment, and only 13% of those with a substance use disorder received treatment in Michigan. So these, are the, these last three statistics here are representative of um, issues that can directly relate to how insurance covers mental health care. And although there may be many reasons for not accessing care, all reasons need to be investigated due to the high prevalence of mental illness and the low prevalence of care being provided. Here's a real life example of um, a uh, situation where possible lacking parity affected someone. This was a complaint that was um, submitted through the Kennedy Forum's complaint registry. And as you can see here, the um, person's daughter was sent to the emergency room. She was in the middle of a mental health crisis from what, it, what we can tell here. She was having thoughts of self-harm and suicide, so that absolutely warrants treatment. Um, and her treatment was repeatedly reviewed for medical necessity, um, triggered by the insurance company. And, um, Ultimately, she was not approved to continue to get care, and so she lost out on, on mental health care in this time. And in this case, if the health plan did not have a similar restriction for medical surgical care, then this could represent a, repre a violation of the Mental Health um, Addiction Equity Act, as well as the patients violate the right for the patient to receive equitable mental health care. And again, since Michigan has not enacted a law that would determine if health insurers are providing <clears throat> equitable coverage, this is a situation that could be persisting in Michigan. So this project identified the problem as um, Michigan does not have a state law that requires health plans to report their compliance. This leads to a lack of clarity into health insurers' compliance with the federal parity law. Therefore, the MHPAEA may not be getting in implemented, and those seeking mental health treatment may be experiencing barriers. So the purpose of this project was to conduct a comprehensive analysis of three policy options that Michigan could choose to pursue relating to parity, as well as develop recommendations for state law that would ensure compliance with the federal parity law, as well as the state par parity law and provide guidance to the Michigan Department of Insurance and Financial Services for implementation of the parity laws. Two frameworks were used to guide this uh, policy analysis process that is evidence-based. We first had the Bardock's Eightfold Path, 
And then we also use the CDC's policy analytical framework. And there are several steps that align with each other between the two um, frameworks, but otherwise the CDC framework was used to supplement and it provided the tools necessary for a deeper analyzation as well as uh, measurement of options and prioritization of the most favorable, um, highest rated option. So, um, gray literature was utilized to complete the environmental scan, and this included federal documents, um, state websites, and websites of knowledgeable state mental health websites. I said that again. Um, and an environmental scan was done to assess the actions that other states were taking um, towards parity implementation and compliance monitoring. And so um, parity laws in the 50 states plus DC were reviewed and found that 17 states had laws requiring to report their compliance. Of the nine that had documented enforcement, seven of them had reporting requirements. Enforcement in these cases occurred when states were able to um, determine that a uh, violation to um, parity was occurring and they administered corrective action plans as well as was associated with fines to the insurance company. And um, so that was a big finding in the environmental um, scan. Other things that were found in the environmental scan um, included best practices identified from these states that found success in implementing um, the parity laws. They had some best practices and they included um, ways for, um, oh, the, the number one um, success point here of implementing is having these reporting requirements, which is what those best practices stated. So it's really important. Um, and then the other best practices that they use to enhance communication and collaboration in the process of implementation, um, and this was done between the insurance department and the health plans. The first was the development of standardized parity and insurance related terminology. And this is to ensure shared understanding between all parties in the um, submission reporting process. They also created standardized materials for compliance, such as templates, workbooks, and checklists to help the, guide the insurance companies into knowing exactly what is going to be expected in the reporting requirement. They also collaborated with mental health agencies to access their specialized mental health knowledge to help with uh, determining compliance, and they collaborated with ad advocacy groups to educate the public about parity. As far as the uh, could you go back, yep. please? Thank you. Um, as far as the scientific literature review went, only one study was found that directly observed uh, state implementation strategies. There are other um, studies that were included in the project, and these helped, these supported the use of um, requirement laws. They found that when the MHPAEA, the Federal Mental Health Parity Law, of 2008 was implemented, they found an increase in consumer, uh, consumer spending that was associated with increased utilization of mental health services, as well as improved access to mental health treatments, a more variety of mental health treatments were able to be accessed. They also found a reduction in the use of quantitative treatment limitations and non-quantitative treatment limitations. The scientific literature <coughs> studies were also utilized when comparing policy options against the criteria in the CDC framework. So the policy options that we identified was adoption of state reporting requirement law with uh, best practices, without best practices, and no adoption of state reporting requirement law. On the next slide, on this slide, we'll review a table which was, represents my analysis of the three policy options. And if you can look on this side, this is the three <coughs> policy options here. On the top, you'll see the criteria that um, they were compared against, which includes public health impact, feasibility, and economic and budgetary impacts. And we're going to focus on this one that's highlighted because this was um, the option that was found to have the highest rating and the most favorable for Michigan to pursue. It was found to have um, a high and favorable public health impact, a medium feasibility of adoption, 
uh, favorable budget impacts and more favorable economic impacts in relation to the benefits. So digging into um, a little bit deeper into what went into um, the rating of the chosen prioritized uh, option here. As far as public health impact goes, um, implementing a state law that would improve uh, access to mental health care for more than half of Michigan's population, that's a large, that's a high effect size with a large reach. So that's why I was given the high, um, high rating. And also best practices would ensure uh, efficient implementation of the state law um, as well as the federal parity law. And it could potentially allow the consumers to experience the benefits and the protections of these laws quicker and to a fuller extent. As far as feasibility goes, I was given a moderate likelihood of adoption and this is due to several competing factors. Um, factors that hinder adoption include the fact that all past bills have failed to advance and no current monitoring bill is in the legislative session. Parity efforts are simply not being prioritized in Michigan um, and this is re also reflected in the lack of funding um, in the proposed 2024 to 2025 um, state executive budget and it's also never been included in any of the previous budgets either. Additionally, Blue Cross uh, owns 60% of the private um, healthcare marketplace. And so if they choose to oppose, this would be a really strong force to work against. Finally, um, only 4% of Americans uh, were surveyed to know about uh, parity. So without more public knowledge, um, this is a big hindrance to a parity bill being passed. Factors that enhance adoption include the general increased public awareness of mental health after um, COVID and unfortunately after the shootings that have been occurring. Um, a study found that state parity laws were strongly supported by legislators in states where a mass shooting occurred in the previous three years. The current pressures additionally, um, Enhancing feasibility is the current pressure from the federal government through the Consolidated Appropriations Act, also helps to raise awareness. And we currently have a group of senators um, that are showing support for parity bills. From a budgetary um, aspect, it was given favorable and more favorable. There are moderate costs to implement. So there was a, a package of monitoring bills that failed to advance in the 2022 um, legislative uh, session and um, there was a fiscal impact that was done on those bills and they estimated no fiscal impact on the state to for that to be implemented and this was rationalized because um, the reporting requirements are asking no more than what the Consolidated Appropriations Act is asking to have these documents ready nonetheless um, we're not currently as far as I can tell, we're not doing any compliance monitoring. So um, a analysis of um, states that had implemented uh, a reporting requirement law, an analysis of their budget was done, their budgets were done for those reporting requirements. And these states allocated between $55,000 and $200,000 to uh, for the length of time distributing, uh, for the money to be distributed between one and three years. So um, if Michigan were to enact a state monitoring law, they may have to uh, allocate about, you know, fit between 55,000 and 200,000 um, to the Department of Insurance. And there would be no cost to consumers um, as research does not support the parity increases insurance premiums. And in fact, they would likely be financially protected with, um, in some cases, patients were reimbursed um, money for paying out of pocket when they should not have been and one in one of those enforcement examples and economically costs are low relative to, to the benefit of improved mental health care access for 56 percent of michigan's population with less barriers to mental health care insured this could uh, lead to a better quality of life improved work productivity and reduced mental illness disability So our recommendations would be for Michigan to adopt a state, state reporting requirement law and utilize best practices discussed today um, to aid state and federal parity law implementation. All right, so now that we have prioritized an option to seek, 
Um, the next step is to clarify the strategy for getting it, them enacted and implemented. Um, so that starts with today, even, um, educating the public, educating people involved in policy, um, but especially raising awareness and um, educating up to policymakers about the importance of including reporting requirements in any um, bill that will be constructed. Um, there is currently a non-monitoring parity bill in the 2023 legislation, it's SB 27. This was introduced by Senators Anthony, Wojno, Geis, Kavanaugh, Singh, and Cheng. So part of this strategy, strategy specifically would be to discuss, um, talk with their representatives, and discuss the possibility of either making a change to this legislation or um, sponsoring a new bill that would include reporting requirements. The American Psychiatric Association has created um, model parity legislation for all 50 states. And this legislation is very comprehensive and includes reporting requirements in it. So if a new parity bill were to be introduced, we would recommend that they um, follow the APA template. Additionally, reaching out with the Department of In uh, Insurance and Financial Service representatives to discuss the possibility of creating these best practice materials. And then the final piece of um, this strategy is just dissemination and sharing this information. Um, as far as for the policy, we would plan to speak to um, legislative representatives. Um, the IPPSR is providing many opportunities for dissemination to policy audiences, um, as well as a professional policy journal submission. For the healthcare audience, um, I will be doing a presentation this Saturday at the annual um, Michigan chapter of the American Psychiatric Nurse Association Conference. And the, for the public, a, uh, ho I'll be hosting a webinar um, for the Mental Health Association of Michigan that will be free of cost uh, next Wednesday. And that's my references. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Hannah and Katie, for your work, and, and Marianne for your association's advocacy. Um, so as Hannah mentioned at the end of her presentation, and as Matt did in the beginning, uh, the purpose of this program is to advance uh, research for the purposes of creating good public policy. And as Hannah noted, uh, IPSER will be working with both Hannah and Katie uh, and their mentors over the coming uh, weeks and months to provide opportunities for them such as this to present that information. Uh, did, does anyone have any questions about uh, the work that they've talked about or uh, for Marianne? Yes. I'll just use the mic. Sure, you shall. <laughs> I wish you all had the other way before. Uh, there's, there's problems with um, public support of physical health treatment and insurance, as you know. And we have a national struggle on that front. Is the problem with public support for mental health policy changes a prejudice or a suspicion that mental health problems are somehow character flaws and not physically, uh, chemically uh, happening to individuals. I mean, what is the source of this problem? I, I suspect that it's what I said, a prejudice that it's a character flaw and not a chemical thing. I mean. I appreciate and all your academic analysis. Can you identify yourself, please? What's that? You are, who are you? Can you say who you are? Your name, please. My name is Mary Pollock. I worked for the Department of Mental Health for 10 years during okay. 1980 to 1990 during deinstitutionalization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then they merged the departments. And I used to sit next to the doctors and the lawyers, and I heard lots of the history <laughs> of the public mental health system. So, but it, it, why is there this split in this prejudice? I guess, I guess how I would respond to you um, as a professional, also somebody who ended up in the field because of lots of family members with mental illness myself. Unfortunately, I know it's 2023, but mental health stigma is unfortunately alive and well. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we have all this evidence that there's a genetic component to mental health conditions, there's a biological, physiological evidence, but unfortunately, I think that, you know, blaming mom and dad, you know, for the loved one, the kid's mental health condition, um, even though we know trauma, childhood trauma, I don't want to ignore the fact that trauma can be a contributor. But I think that we're still blaming people. And I still hear it, you know, as an advocate. Um, I still hear people being called schizophrenics as opposed to being a person with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't say to somebody, you know, who, oh, there's that cancer over there, you know. And I think that, unfortunately, you know, and, and I've been in this field for 30 years, and so from the beginning of the system to the end and everything in between, I see that people, particularly with more serious mental illness, are treated differently. I think the biggest example is the fact that even though we have the Amtala law, about physical health care being provided in an emergency room, whether you have insurance or not, we don't really see that equivalent with mental health. You would never see, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the onboarding in the emergency rooms where children and adolescents go, they're in a crisis, and they're told there's no bed, and you hear about these kids that are sitting in these ERs for upwards of 30, 60 days. Now, if someone was in the throat of a, throes of a heart attack, or a stroke, I would hope we wouldn't say, we're gonna wait till you're dead and then we'll treat you. You know, it's, it's the equivalent in my mind. Everywhere I look, I can see where there is a difference between the way we treat people with mental health conditions versus the way we treat people with physical health conditions. And until we really understand that the mind and the body cannot be separated, that they're, they're linked together, you know, because you look at the fact that now we have research that shows that bodily inflammation can contribute to depression, anxiety, and suicidality. Who would have thought, right? So I think, unfortunately, your question is an excellent one, and I say absolutely stigma and a prejudice against people, with, particularly with more significant behavioral health conditions and addictions, is alive and well. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Sam. Yes? Right here. Yeah, so I think this policy discussion is really powerful, um, and I wonder sort of where this discussion intersects with like the leadership that there is in the state. So I recognize if we were to do all of this, there, there is a lack of providers across the state. So so what is, what do you guys think about that, or what is your sort of response to actually being able to manage the care um, should these policy changes happen? I guess you know. That's something that we talk about a lot amongst like mental health advocacy organizations and ourselves, the fact that we have a lack of providers. Um, I think that, you know, now I'll speak as someone who was a direct service provider. I mean, I was a case manager 30 years ago working with adults with severe mental illness for Community Mental Health of Oakland County. Um, and as a person with a master's degree, um, had to work two jobs a lot with a master's degree because social workers don't typically make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And what I find fascinating about community mental health or, or people doing direct service is the closer you get to the person who needs the service, the less money you make, and the farther you get away from them, the more money you make. Because I've been both service provider and administrator. Um, and so I think it's about working conditions, about, and, and the public mental health side, the paperwork requirements are absolutely ridiculous. People can't really provide good care when they have super high caseloads that are ridiculous and all these paper, Medicaid paperwork requirements. Um, there's a lot of liability and responsibility in serving people, especially when you work with people with higher acuity needs. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a great field. I'm glad I did it. But I know that a lot of people shy away from it for all of the reasons that I just said, that it's, it's not easy, it's high stress. If you don't have a lot of support, you can burn out in it. Um, the pay at the very beginning is not the greatest. It's abysmal. 
I mean, I'm just going to be really blunt because I, I did it, you know, back in the 90s I started. So I think that we have to take a long look at, and it's not just about pay for people. It's about benefits, about working conditions, and frankly, it's about how much support they get in doing the job. Because the one thing I would say is that um, I remember being a young case manager in the 90s and being given a caseload of 45 people and being told, here you go, good luck with that. Now I'm what, 29, 30 years old, you know? I mean, it's like there needs to be, we need to be supporting the people that are doing the work. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that have the most responsibility. So, our institute, with support from the Michigan Health Endowment Fund for the past few legislative sessions, has been doing a series of health forums uh, for legislators who sit on the policy standing committees and uh, the appropriation subcommittees. And this issue of providers has certainly come up time and time again. I think, if I remember correctly, at one session last year or two years ago, we learned that I believe there are no clinical psychologists in northern Michigan or the yeah. Upper Peninsula, right? None. None. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, along with the issues of parity or integrative care is how do we get people uh, to go into these fields uh, in, in the future? So I, I know that's certainly a question that, that's out there. I, I appreciate that question. Thank you. Yes. So mine isn't really a question, it's kind of a thank you. I am um, one of the attorneys from the Legislative Service Bureau for the last 25 years. I've been the attorney who's drafted all of the mental health, yes, we've worked together and I've worked with um, So I just wanted to say thank you because, well, especially like Senate Bill 597 and 598, we worked on those like quite a bit. So I'm nonpartisan, I can't influence policy, so don't beat me up for anything <laughs> that you seen that you didn't like. Um, but it helps to be able to come to something like this to understand because we don't always get the background and we don't always get the reason that you're trying to change something. And if you ask, you know, someone who's telling you to do that, they might not understand. So I really appreciate being included in, in this kind of forum so I can kind of get some background on, on what I'm trying to do. Well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you for your work. It, it's good to hear that uh, we still have folks such as you at the LSB who have uh, a long history of experience in a particular field that's very important uh, as you work with legislators and, and, and folks, uh, uh, stakeholders crafting crafting such legislation. So thank you, thank you for your work. Yes, in the back. Um, use this also. There you go. Um, as a mother of a son who's uh, now in his 40s um, with bipolar, but he's very well functioning, fortunately, but. Um, I'm wishing you could do something completely different and maybe a step down from what you're doing. Um, I would like to see some sort of mandatory parent meeting before their kids go into high school in an auditorium with some specialist telling the signs to look for. Because I understand that it all starts when they're much younger. And if they could get treatment or get checked by someone while they're in middle school or high school, um, once they're out in the world, once they're 18, and you want them to do something or go to someone, they don't want to, possibly, because they don't think there's anything wrong, or if they're away at college. And also the eating thing. <laughs> um, my son ate Taco Bell for four years, <laughs> and so I know he was in terrible condition. <laughs> but, um, you know, it just seems like it really needs to be tackled early on and the parents need to know the signs to look for because they just will not cooperate later or they'll be in a different state or you don't know what's going on and it can get built up to it's really a bad state. Now, you know, that's, that, that's very true and I know um, my wife works as a, in a guidance office at an area high school and um, we have discussions regarding parents all the time. Um, and, and you make a good good point because a lot of times the first place that these um, symptoms are seen and talked to is at the school level, at the K-12 level, either elementary or middle school or high school. 
And parent education is indeed very, very important and a key part of uh, the entire system that needs to be developed. Of course, on the back, uh, following that, are the resources available to parents as well, and that's and that's kind of what this discussion has been well, about. Well, that's what, the second point I was going to make is maybe you could get something passed um, for children, you know, before 18, some sort of insurance that would cover them. Maybe legislatures would understand that better. Um, you know, as far as mental health, because um, I think I think it's you know 50% of people in America have mental health problems. There's a certain amount that really have bad mental health problems, and that can start when they're younger, but could also be corrected to a great extent. So, thank anyway. you. Appreciate appreciate your comments, and like I said, we'll be taking this information forward. Um, I know that there are uh, various legislators right now that have again raised interest. I believe, I think it's Representative Brayback is chairing a uh, subcommittee as well. So um, we'll have some avenues over the course of time to, to present these. But we're going to need help from parents such as yourself, right? To come forward, which is very difficult, I understand, but to come forward and tell their own personal stories because. That's what elected officials, in particular, I've learned over the course of my time, react to, are the personal stories. We can present them all the great research. Marianne can present them all the great advocacy that comes from an organization such as hers, and there are others out there. But it is the personal stories, as we've heard here a little bit today, that are of true impact. So thank you. Yes, one more question. I'm Beverly Hines. I'm with Citizens for Prison Reform, and we are working to address the trauma that comes from solitary confinement. My son was in solitary at a local jail for just 45 days and was already suicidal. So we may not have a family member that's incarcerated, but it affects all of us in our communities. So just be a voice for those people that are incarcerated. They may have committed a crime, but the punishment is their loss of freedom. They do not need to be put in solitary confinement. Well, as one who, uh, myself, who uh, watched deinstitutionalization happen, as I think we all know, the jails, our prison system, is really our largest provider of mental health services right now. And that's something that we need to change. Thank you, Anna and Katie, for your work. And Dr. Annis and Dr. Goldstein for their work with these students. And thank you all for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you.